look too weird, okay? <laughs> what? You said a lot of questions about how we do this thing. Not the having babies part. Boop, boop. Never mind. It was a I funny have to joke, completely cut this out now. Catch the joke, honey. Boop, boop. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Front Porch Catholic. I'm Erica. And I'm Joe. And it has been a really long time since we have done a YouTube video or at least a podcast. And life has just kind of carried on here at our homestead in Ohio. And we normally like to share the grit and glory of this life. 2021 has brought a lot of new changes for everybody. And for our family, it is bringing a new baby. This makes number... I don't know. <laughs> Eight. Eight kids we're expecting at the end of the summer. And because that's such a unusual thing, we have been getting a lot of questions uh, directed to us about how we do this thing called family life with so many kids and on the kind of income that we happen to have. And so we're gonna do a series here um, about some of these aspects of family life and how we do it. Things that we think might be helpful just for some of you guys. And so the first one we're gonna do today is about money and how we live on not a lot of it. <laughs> Everybody needs it, but you actually don't need a ton of it to live a happy and fulfilling life. I really wanted to plan out this talk, but you said we should just fly by the seat of Wing it. <laughs> we should just wing it. So anyway, so we're winging it. If you have questions, you can put them in the comments. We'll try to address those either in the comments or in future videos. So um, I think it's important to start by saying that we want to really give everybody hope and a reason to believe that you can live um, a really dynamic life without having to trade time for money. To that end, we're gonna talk about some particulars, like we're gonna talk about real dollar amounts, um, debt, tithing, all those kind of things that are a real practical part of life. And we're not, this is not meant to be a like, woe is us or woe is one income family thing at all. We just wanna talk real numbers because I think people just need, I mean, when they're looking for answers, they want to know how realistic is it. They want numbers. But I did grow a beard. Oh, yeah. So that I look a little bit more homeless so that you feel worse for us. <laughs> I thought you grew it to look manly. Well, that too. But it has helped the begging. I'm kidding. We really are just hoping to what? Well, be realistic. So not give false hope, but at the same yeah. time realize that it's possible. But it requires a different lifestyle than is proposed by the world oftentimes. So especially, I think, in watching YouTube channels... Uh, which can be a bit unrealistic, you know, and, and looking at the world. We always assume that everybody else has everything figured out and everything's good in everybody else's lives. And that's probably not the reality. Um, and so we kind of want to share with you how we do it as a big family. This is not the only way to do it as a big family, but mm -hmm. this is how we've been able to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So pretty much the, the kind of the, the core of the I don't know, the core of the price, not a problem, but the core of our financial situation mm -hmm. is that I am a teacher in a Catholic school. And Erica... I'm a homemaker and a hobby farmer. So she spends money. <laughs> and you and I make, make money. money. <laughs> not, now that's not, not true. entirely true, but it's, it's mostly, mostly true. true. It's teamwork. And, yeah, it, teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work. So Perfect. with one income at a Catholic school, ever, we're talking like... With my master's degree now, I make about, oh, 40 something, 40 low 40s a year. Uh, that's, in addition to that, we have our health insurance covered. Yeah, that's a big one. So that's a, that's a big deal. <clears throat> if we were self-employed, that would be huge. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking more than $10,000 a year for health insurance, but that's part of my compensation. So mm -hmm. that should not be ignored. So the, the, still the question is, I mean, when we look at federal poverty level guidelines, we are below the federal poverty level. We and, are poor. And yet, I have always felt like we've wanted for nothing. We have a very comfortable life. We have our home mortgage. We live in a beautiful, safe, stable home in a wonderful community. We have acreage, we have animals, we have vehicles that we've paid for. Um, we both have college educations. Our kids go to school, some of them, most of them homeschool. I mean, we have everything that we, we go on need. vacations. We go on vacations. We built a pool last year. If you watch our channel, you know what we do. And, um, and yet we don't have a lot of debt besides our mortgage. And that has been a big piece of it. But I want to back up a little bit. Let's back up. I think it is important to identify why, if you want to live on, a, on one income or on a small income, 
and still have a fulfilling life, it's very important to identify the purpose. Like what, what are you going to do? Why are you going to do it? And you have to recognize that it's very different. It's very countercultural, and it's not what the world's going to sell you and not what they're going to make easy to do. So our, you know, when we were beginning our family, we really wanted it to be a goal to have me in the home um, so that I could focus all of my presence here. We just see that as extremely valuable for our family. Um, and I knew that I, I worked outside the home at one point. Um, thankfully, I was able to pull back from that and to really focus on raising our children, stabilizing our home, and making this place a safe haven of peace for our family and for Joe as our family grew. So um, that was our goal. So we knew we had to make sacrifices to make that happen. And we had to adjust our lifestyle and direct our lifestyle based on that goal. So that meant you That meant in the early days, particularly, that was maybe the most crucial time to set ourselves up to be able to do what we do now. Mm -hmm. And kind of the one, one element that we did in the early days <clears throat> was that we didn't get ourselves into huge amounts of debt very early on. Mm -hmm. So in the first five years of our marriage, um, we had significantly more income, even though I was not making a lot. Erica was working was for working the first year time. and a half of mm -hmm. our marriage, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, we came in paying down debt pretty rapidly. We bought a fixer-upper home that mm -hmm. was not a lot of money. So we it had was a like very, $53,000. Very, yeah, $53,000. It was a foreclosure. Um, so very, very low amounts of money going out in the early days mm -hmm. so that we could um, kind of set ourselves up for the future when we knew that money would be significantly tighter, I guess you could say. Right. Yeah. And we made, I mean, our lifestyle was pretty simple. I think about our early dating days in our marriage. We didn't really go, I mean, we've never really been like going out kind of people, but we would have um, theology and wine date nights in our basement when our babies were little. We just get, actually we started turning our desires into things we were proficient at and had hobbies come out of like we started making our own wine because we found like it was cheaper to make it and like hey we can like buy all the materials up front make a bunch of wine and then have wine at our disposal to share with friends for a really inexpensive um uh investment or whatever so it's cheap not a lot of money. not a lot of money <coughs> so we did things like that and we listened to, to talks on cd which like was before podcast days mm, back in the day so we didn't go on vacations we didn't have a lot of output of money on extras um, but and yet lived a very peaceful, happy, fulfilling family life. So that was key too, not um, disposing of our money. So those <laughs> kind of life choices. We got a fixer upper, got out of that debt, paid it off when we sold that house and moved to a country property. Um, we've always paid cash for cars, that kind of thing. So those are practical mm -hmm. little bits, but I think on the theoretical level, um, income or money, really, it, most people's tendency is to spend whatever they make. So people are like, oh, how can I do this? You know, right now we're making sixty thousand, and if we go to one income, we'll only make forty-five thousand. How will it work? And not to be naive, but part of the reason it's going to work is because it'll have to work. <laughs> if we made sixty thousand, we might we'd little probably little spend sixty thousand. Yeah. We don't make that, so, so we don't spend we it. Don't spend it. So there's an element of that too. I mean, nobody thinks, in a sense, sort of nobody thinks it's possible because that's not what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. But if you were doing it, you would be doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty straightforward way of saying it. You just work with what you have and don't spend what you don't have. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But part of that, part of being able to not spend what you don't have is also to, I don't know, moderate your desires. So it can be really easy, I suppose, although we are both sort of homebodies to some extent, it can be easy to, to compare yourselves to the lifestyle of others. Like, we don't have new cars, and so if you want a new car, and that's really important to you, then you can't teach a, as a religion teacher and have only one income. It, won't, it just won't happen, like, because you're gonna spend an entire year's income on a car. Mm -hmm. And so if you're trying to, to do that, Kind of backpedaling from practical ways of not spending money. I think it's really important to talk about tithing, because for us, when them, when we, when money comes in, or someone is generous with us and gives us a monetary gift, or you get a bonus, or even our children. The federal have, government give us fourteen hundred bucks a person. <laughs> right. 
before our kids make money on their egg sales or whatever jobs they do for someone else, we right away, we have, we all set aside 10% and we give that to our church, to charity, to some good cause. We tithe 10% of whatever comes in. And I think that as a starting point for what to do with your money has been incredibly key for us because it, it compels us to be generous, to think of other people first. And it then, you know, kind of influences how you do spend the rest of your money or how you don't spend the rest of your money. I mean, it's like tithing is kind of a framework for all of, mm. all of that. It puts money in the right context because yeah. money can either be a goal or money can be a tool. Yeah. And it's easy to have money become the goal. Mm -hmm. And tithing is, it, it is, <laughs> there's a reason God told us to tithe. Yeah. It's because we need to be detached from our money because otherwise it becomes a goal for us. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it even becomes a goal for us. It can be about mm -hmm. what we have or do not have mm -hmm. monetarily. And that's of course always a temptation, mm -hmm. but that'll just, that'll suck your life away. Right. So tithing, um, paying off what debt you have, not taking on a ton of debt and being realistic about your family's needs. So I think once you tithe and get rid of your debt, I think for us, it has been key to focus on the necessities of life, like food, clothing, shelter. Yeah, but um, at the same time, like well, you have to be realistic that if that's all you're doing is buying food, clothing, and shelter, you will burn up and become a shriveled, angry person. Right, right, and cry and all that stuff. Yeah, which so we may have done from time to time. but There have definitely been low points and difficult mm -hmm. moments. But so it's, it's good to have, and I guess I'm going to flip it around and come from the income side, if that's okay, a little bit here. Yeah. One of the key things that has allowed us to do what we do is to have moments in our, whatever it is, how long have we been married? Uh, seven. I don't 17 know. 17 years. She doesn't either, so it's okay. 17-year um, marriage, moments when um, we have had chunks of money come in. And chunks of money, being able to either earn chunks of money at a time or have chunks of money come in because we sell a house or because we have you know, farm, we sell animals, and these animals are not $15 a piece animals. Yeah. Add a couple of zeros, you get the right idea. So when we have those sales, if we need a major amount of money coming in, we have a means of earning, if we need to, a significant chunk of change. Mm -hmm. And I think that is key. The, the, the financial gurus always say, like, set aside 10% of your... And the reason for that is so that you can have a significant chunk of change if you need it. Mm -hmm. um, nest egg. Yeah, a nest egg, but... Or... You have something that you can do to earn a significant chunk of change. So in, mm -hmm. in various years, I was I was doing landscaping in the summertime, mm -hmm. and those landscaping contracts in the early summer, I'd get paid part in advance, and so I'd get checks for forty five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, that allows you to take care of a lot of pressing needs all at once, because a lot of needs are more than a hundred bucks a month. So you need to have some times when you can earn more than a hundred bucks a month. Mm -hmm to take care of those pressing needs in a very practical sense. So yeah. if you don't have a skill, you can develop a skill. Get a skill. You can develop a skill. We I have in my marriage discovered so many interests and abilities strictly because I've had the time to do that really because I'm not working outside the home I've been able to explore my interests and a lot of our extra income streams have been because of my hobbies. I know there's the landscaping, but for a time we were in some direct sales and that was an incredible time in our marriage and really changed the course and direction and expectations of what we were able to do. We've got our animals. Those all kind of came as little side interests that then we were like, hey, this can earn us some money. We educated ourselves about them, um, learned the lingo and found, you know, those niches where those animals were desirable. So <laughs> of, yeah, there's have, baby chicks over chicks. there. <laughs> Speaking of animals. And those are not the ones we sell for $1,500. Oh, no, <clears throat> but they are an income stream for our daughter. She's got a little egg business on the side. They're her chickens. So I'm trying to train her up in that too. Yeah. And one of the things that's allowed us to ha have these extra income streams is that I work in a job that does not consume my life. Yeah. And so if both people are already working in jobs that they feel are consuming their lives, they're leaving at 8 o'clock in the morning or they've got an hour commute, they're leaving at 7 o'clock in the morning, and they're getting home at 6 o'clock in the evening, mm -hmm. there is no way you have a life left. And I'm not meaning to be mean here, <laughs> but like you're not going to be time. able to find extra income streams because you just don't have time for it. Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of be realistic about it. If that's the situation you find yourself in, mm -hmm. an extra income stream is not going to be probably a possibility. Right, so there's a payoff in having one income that doesn't consume your life 
having a lot of time in which you can explore hobbies, interests, and other avenues of income. But emergencies do come up, and so it's been helpful, and, and it gives us peace to know that we have these extra ways to earn chunks of money that will meet a real need. Um, so. In another very practical application of this, we have had the fortune of having, if, if you're not in huge amounts of debt on your home, you can have home equity lines of credit, which is what we did for a time yeah. because we had some major expenses. And instead of destroying our lives, because we weren't so in debt on our house, we were able to take out a home equity line of credit, take care of the expense, and then pay it off at a relatively low interest rate. We have also had people in our lives mm -hmm. that have given us loans. Yeah. Um, and so figuring out what your safety net is, I think is key. It also takes away so much of the anxiety and stress yeah. from it. So I guess my, my moral of the whole story is find a safety net. Mm -hmm. And not as an advertisement for having only one income, but having only one income gives one of the people a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. And the one person having a lot of freedom in turn actually gives the other person who has the job a lot of freedom as well. Because when I come home, she hasn't been at a job all day. Not that she hasn't been working all day, but she hasn't been at a job all day. And so I, we're not both entering into our home life incredibly stressed. Mm -hmm. And so her freedom to pursue other things during the day and even just to raise our children well um, allows me then when I come home the freedom to not have to try to do all of those things because she's been able to do them. And it's, it's not seen as one of the, you know, it's not a financial benefit, but it has huge financial ramifications mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. in what I'm able to do as a result of that. Okay. So, yeah, so it's more than just about money. It's also about time. It's about your goal and your purpose and about not being afraid to, um, to live on one income. A lot of it is, does come down to the practicals. And I think people are afraid of imagining what those practicals will look like. But I just, we just wanted to, you know, give hope that it is possible. We're 17 years into this marriage. Again, I feel like a spoiled brat. We have, we lack nothing. And really so much of it has come from our dependence um, upon God's providence. We've just really tried to not, um, try to realize that we are not able to manipulate all these things to meet our needs, but we really have to be docile to his plan for our family, for our life and the use of our time and our gifts. So, um, yeah, I think that, and that that providence doesn't mean like a, a naivety or right. a stupidity. It means a trust. Mm -hmm. And really, I believe that to be very important. Um, and, it, and it starts with tithing, but it's an overall understanding of that we are not God. Yeah. And therefore, things are outside of our control sometimes, and that's okay. And we are not in this, in a sense, for our ourselves you know like we even within kind of a micro scale here like why do we need the house why do we need the cars if it's just about us then that's a certain empty cause and that not really mo motivate you to make sacrifices but if we realize okay it's about being able to have eight kids like that openness to those kids who will live forever and who will have children. And who will have and children, children maybe. Have children. Right. A legacy. Yeah. And so then, all of a sudden, the sacrifice to drive a 15-year-old truck versus a new truck makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. and, you're, and we're willing to do those things. If it was about us, it would be a lot harder to make those sacrifices. Yeah. So, so ladies, if you're thinking about staying home, or families, if you're thinking about going down to one income or struggling to survive on one income, um, just try to maybe keep those goals in mind and trust that uh, knowing your family and your family's needs, your real needs, um, not your wishes or wants, but what your needs are and being able to meet those in a variety of ways uh, is really key to having a happy and peaceful home. So, and not just one that is like sustained, that you, but one that like, that, that can thrive. I really feel like we've done that. You think so? Yeah. Are you satisfied? Yeah. You think our kids are satisfied? Yeah. Excellent. Good. Well, we're going to continue our series with um, things on family prayer, uh, how to make that work, what that looks like, um, why. It looks like kids falling asleep and screaming <laughs> and distraction. There's all of that. <laughs> but you can pray together and it's fruitful. I want to do one on legacy. Like why, you know, a different perspective on being open to life. 
Once you have eight kids, you do start to think about things a little differently. <laughs> Other things that we hope will be helpful to people who are seeking to live a more simple, um, trusting life that's fulfilling and has a purpose. We may, we may do one on facial hair growth. We should do one on facial hair growth. Do you have a lot to say about that at this point? I don't know. This is the last time we did a podcast. Did I have a Fu Manchu? Yeah, it was during the, like, a year ago during the beginning of the cultural crazies. But anyway, so it's back. It's back to stay? Yeah. Okay. No, I don't know. Who knows? I guess things will And that's change. actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's my final point. Okay. Is that one of the keys to financial success? <laughs> I don't think we can call ourselves financially <laughs> successful. <laughs> Surviving. It's financial survival. One of the keys to financial survival it really is willingness to adapt, to change, mm -hmm. uh, to not assume that that what the what is accepted by most people that two incomes is accepted by most people, it, and being able to be different than that, and also in your own life realizing that yeah, right now our financial situation is good, but something could happen next week that would change that completely, yeah. and then we'll make a podcast about how we can have it. <laughs> how do we do that? But. Yeah. Be, be, being willing to adapt or realizing that it will be a constant adaptation mm -hmm. of life to, and that's good. to whatever is, is happening. Mm -hmm. Guide, but it's got to be guided by some principles. Otherwise, you're just rolling, you know, you're just a boat meandering around aimlessly. Yeah, you need anchors. So, mm -hmm. so you, there's got to be that trust and the purpose and then within that adaptation. Yeah. So until next time, we hope you're made happy and holy through your work and we will see you again soon. Thanks for joining us. Bye.